web startup. We want to use all the latest, greatest, coolest web technologies, right? And just so happen to have our source code right here. So it's using jQuery and WebSockets and that stuff that was cool at least a year ago. <laughs> and as you can see, we just basically get the value user age and we ship it off to the server where some super secret processing happens. And then we get back our life expectancy. But this isn't really the program I would like to write. Because it's not really type safe. JavaScript doesn't do anything for type safety. And even if it did, well, the remote call in the server is not type safe at all. And that kind of irks me. Furthermore, it's not synchronous. And while it's not really apparent in this example, because I couldn't fit the cumbersome example on one slide, programming with uh, callbacks can be a bit hairy at times. And worst of all, this program is not complete. It needs a separate server component written in whatever language, which means that we will not be able to share uh, code and data across the uh, network as we would like to. Now, fortunately, we have come up with a little library which lets us write this program in <coughs> a style that is a little bit more reminiscent of what we'd like to write. We call this library haste.app because it allows you to write apps on top of the haste compiler. It's very imaginative. So we start off with a simple bootstrap function. We don't really need to care about this, just configuration craft. Here we have our super secret server side source. So you can see th this server uh, annotation. This code will uh, execute on the server as it is uh, located in the server model. Here we have our, the entry point of our application where we bring this life expectancy uh, function into scope as a remote closure. And here we start off the client. And on the client, we simply attach to the uh, on click event handler of the uh, send button a simple handler which does the same as the JavaScript version. It gets the user's age, it ships it off to the server, and waits for the reply, and then it just displays the life expectancy to the user. Uh, as we can see, we have managed to cram all of this into a single program. So, how do we get from this? to this. So it's kind of easy. Just fire up the terminal and we compile our program. Now we compile the program again. So the first compilation pass with the, the normal GHC compiler creates a binary. This is our server binary. We can load it just like an L. Oh dear. The second one creates our JavaScript, uh, well not a binary, but bundle, which can be uh, put into the HTML file, and put together with a pre-prepared index.html, we have another version of our web app. Does it work? Oh, it does. That's great. Now, as you can see, since this is a single program, it's also very type safe, even this call across the network. So if someone were to try to pass this on as an H, then simply will not compile. Furthermore, having this as a single program allows us to easily share code between the client and the server, and we're also able to defer decisions on which code should run on the client and which should run on the server. So we're not really tied to or committed to any decisions about uh, how to split our program that we made at first. So when our startup goes bankrupt and we decide to open source the code because, well, we don't, can't run the service anymore, I guess I couldn't afford to pay all of you, sorry. You can just change this line here. Now it's going to run on the client. Don't need to bring it into scope anymore. It's not on the server anymore. Ah, we can recompile this. And it works again. Probably, I haven't shown that to you yet. So, does it work now that everything's on the client? Yeah, it still does. 
It doesn't really show, but this computation was just now moved, just by changing the types around it, moved from the server onto the client. But <coughs> what was you just saw? Well, essentially, we have three different monads. There's a lot of monads, but I'm afraid we need all of them. So we have this client monad, which quite predictably uh, denotes the code for execution of the client in the web browser. It's basically just a thin layer of, uh, of uh, communication primitives and cooperative multitasking on top of the, on top of the normal JavaScript uh, layer, since JavaScript doesn't do any form of concurrence natively. So we cannot need this to get this synchronous programming model you just saw. We also have the uh, server monad, in which any server cycle goes. This doesn't really do anything. It only marks code for execution on the server. Since, well, you can really do just about anything in the IO monad, and you probably want to reuse any previously written IO code there anyway. And we have this rather mysteriously named app monad, which is essentially just uh, shared setup code. This is where you bring your server side functions into scope for use by the, by the client. And we have these four basic primitives. So, as you saw, we have the remote primitive in use um, here. So this takes any remotable computation and, bring, and brings it into scope as a remote closure on the client. And a, a remotable computation is a computation in the server monad which has only serializable inputs and outputs. And a remote closure is essentially a handle to a uh, function on the server side. Then we have this funny little operator. It's pronounced uh, full stop being eaten by two crocodiles. <laughs> <laughs> it takes one of these remote closures and applies it to a single serializable argument. Now, when you're done with the crocodiles, you have this on server primitive which dispatches a fully, di fully applied remote closure to the server, waits for the computation to complete, and then returns the uh, return value of that computation. Finally, we have the run client primitive, which is completely uninteresting. It just marks the beginning, of the entry point of the client-side code. But <coughs> this is really all we need to make a great web application. As we've seen, we can, uh, using only these four, get type-safe calls across the network, and that's great and all, and we also reduce the boilerplate quite a lot. But most web apps need some kind of server-side state. One such web application is another of our failed uh, products. I have no idea why these products keep failing. Uh, it's a slightly minimalist interface and it allows you to exchange messages. Hello. The last message was nothing. What was the old message? So, it essentially swaps messages. So, I have no idea why this product failed, but <laughs> somehow it did. And we have the source code for this Excellent program here as well. It looks rather the same. We bring in haste.app. We also need to have some kind of state holding element using irefs here. And here we have the uh, server side function swap messages instead. So, what we essentially do is that we uh, take a iref, embed it into the server monad, extract it, and then we just modify it as usual. Now, why is this IRF embedded into the IO monad? Well, it's got to do with this list server IO call. So essentially, we, we, as we compile the program twice, we must be sure where any given piece of code executes. And if we're trying to execute some kind of computation like this one, which uh, at the start launch of the server program creates a state holding element, we don't really want to uh, have the user able to access that on the client side. I don't even know what the semantics of that would be, but we, it would probably be very hairy. So what we do is that we perform the computation given to lift server I.O., then we wrap it into the server monad so that we can't touch it anywhere except in the server monad. And then we just pass it around. And it's got this type. It's quite obvious, really. So how does this work? As I showed you before, uh, you compile a program twice. Once with JavaScript using the haste compiler, now you don't have to use <coughs> that one, 
you could easily port this, uh, uh, this library to any other uh, Haskell to JavaScript compiler. Uh, and likewise with the, for the uh, server compiler. You don't have to use GHC, you could use UHC, uh, AGHC, or whatever, whatever is your fancy. And using co conditional compilation magic on just these few primitives and the, uh, the basic types of our library, we get this uh, type safe uh, communication without having to do any compiler hacking at all. So, if we look at the different uh, representations of a few basic types. So, on the client, we obviously need this uh, remote closure thing. We need to be able to refer to uh, uh, functions on the server side. So, it's represented by an ID and a list of uh, arguments so that we can have partially applied closures. On the server, on the other hand, we don't want to touch these remote things because we already have the functions there. So there, the remote type is just represented by a dummy value. On the contrary, when it comes to the server type, since we can't really do any server computations on the client, the client implementation of the server monad is just a dummy value, whereas on the server, it basically just wraps the uh, IO monad. We have the run client function, which uh, I told you marks the entry point of the client side code. Quite easy on the client. We basically just go on to execute uh, the given computation. The server side, we don't want to execute any client code, so we just throw it away and instead enter an event loop, waiting for remote calls from the client. Now, this remote function is probably the only interesting one out of these. So, we need to somehow keep track of uh, which ID represents which function. So, uh, this is the reason for this app moment. Because somehow we, we have to keep a counter or whatever. We have to identify them. So, we increment a remote ID starting out at zero. And on the client, we just throw away the function we're given to, uh, uh, to bring into scope and instead just return a remote closure using that uh, ID that we implemented before. On the server, we have to keep, uh, keep even with the uh, client when it comes to incrementing the, the remote ID. But instead of doing something, well, instead of returning it, we just map this ID to the given function and we return this uh, dummy value. And this uh, table is then used by the aforementioned event loop so that whenever a remote closure is dispatched from the client to the server, the server just has to look at the ID and apply the uh, relevant function to the uh, arguments passed in. The listener IO function is quite simple as well. So on the client, throw away this argument. On the server, don't throw away the argument. So, this is the first attempt at tackling this problem. This has been done a million times before in various different ways. So I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of this because at least one reader was very happy about the comprehensive relative work section of the paper. I think was more happy about that than about our contribution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for JavaScript, you have a bunch of frameworks like conductance, open, and so on. And obviously, they don't do much for type safety, but at least we have the abstraction and uh, some of code sharing uh, between client and server and so on. We have the same for uh, C++. Uh, Oxygen for Camel is doing something quite similar. Uh, it's a full stack solution, which may, see, may be a little more unwieldy, but it's a really nice and really mature thing. We've got AFAX from F Sharp, which does, is very similar to what we're doing, as well as Cloud Haskell. Uh, both of those are from the fact that uh, you unfortunately seem to need some modification to the type system to uh, uh, make them work without the uh, boilerplate. Uh, we have the sum of Haskell EDSL, which essentially lets you write uh, JavaScript in line in a Haskell program and uh, have that executed in the browser and communicate type safely with the host Haskell. And there is a whole bunch of, um, of uh, standalone languages which are specially tailored to this program slicing thing. As for future work, uh, there's lots of interesting uh, things to do. We want to generalize this to use multiple servers because most web apps uh, don't really uh, are not really content with just talking to a single one. Uh, currently, uh, we're working on uh, adding some notion of information flow control to the uh, uh, to the types, so uh, that you don't inadvertently leak information. Also, integrating with the code generator to produce uh, code that works well with some existing uh, 
dynamic approaches to verifying uh, the absence of information leakage. We want to do some templating because uh, currently there are lots of nice <coughs> templating libraries or uh, HTML combinator libraries and so on uh, for um, <coughs> Haskell and it would be very nice to integrate with those. Uh, was also kind of inspired by Simon Marlowe's nice talk uh, yesterday to perhaps do something about the batching of, the, of requests to reduce performance problems and so on. And maybe most importantly of all, we really want to do a large system using this because so far we really haven't done that. So, in conclusion, with our library you get automatic slicing of your Haskell programs, completely type safe, safe, and you don't have to do any compiler hacking. And best of all, you can get this uh, from Cabal right now, today. Thank you. So we have plenty of time for questions. Hello. Uh, so you're talking about type shapes, but you can only guarantee it statically because you have produced both compiled versions. But what if uh, the developer has deployed a new version of the server-side code and the user's browser just cached the old JavaScript? What happens then? Then you have a problem. <laughs> well, because we haven't addressed this problem yet. Of course, so there are ways to, uh, to deal with, with overly eager caching, but uh, yeah, it's definitely something we haven't tackled yet. So right now, if uh, the user has retained the old JavaScript, uh, the user will just see some random error messages because interfaces don't match, uh, or what will happen? What will happen is that you will get an uh, exception thrown in your face, the, you the developer, not the, you the user, and you will have to deal with it somehow. But since you're running the old version of the code, uh, you're probably not going to be able to do anything useful with it. So error handling is uh, uh, one area where we don't really have a great story. Thank you. I, I think I have a very similar question. Um, if I, in the outer monad, I think it was called app monad. Yeah. If I, for some reason, mm, become dependent on whether I'm on the server or the client, either accidentally or intentionally, and then I may have different number of calls to remote, um, the IDs won't, wouldn't match up, right? Exactly. So that way it's crucial that your app main function, as shown in this uh, example, is, uh, is closed. So if you have any free variables which, your, which this application can depend on, uh, then, as you say, you may get out of sync. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned that you still need to generalize to uh, multiple servers, but uh, if you have uh, uh, what if you have multiple client sessions? You said you need to increment IDs on clients and uh, server, but if you have several client sessions at once, they each increment ID by one. Server has incremented ID by n, and they are out of sync. No. no so, so this is a little bit hairy. I should explain that better. Sorry. So uh, essentially, the uh, server does its counting on startup in the app mode. And since uh, you don't uh, have any free variables in there, uh, you get this same count uh, all the time. Ah, I see. And each client does its own counting. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering if you could just tell me a little bit more about the interaction with um, the DOM in the JavaScript side of things. So you're relying on Post to generate the um, JavaScript, but then uh, you have to have an interface to it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, uh, this is really the scope of this work, but Haze does have a, a library for a basic DOM manipulation. It's Unfortunately, uh, still fairly primitive, fairly low level. It's just a uh, basic wrapper on top of the of the usual JavaScript DOM. So this is something where where third party solutions seem to be popping up interestingly. Interestingly, sorry. So what's this, what's the story going on here with libraries? Um, let's say that you want to use something on the server that the client doesn't have available. What does this just ignore it, or does something else go on? Now, then, then you're kind of in for cabal hell uh, raised to the power of two. So, <laughs> uh, you actually have to keep your uh, package environments consistent between uh, haste and JC. And uh, this can be kind of a pain, <coughs> can be a real pain. 
What if you want to use something which just doesn't exist at all on the, on the client side? Doesn't, if you want to use STM, something that doesn't exist? Well, it doesn't really matter so much if it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, since you're not going to use it on the client. Okay. You just need it to type check on the client, right? Uh, so that's no problem. Uh, the problem is when uh, that package is not installable uh, on haste. Well, then you have a problem, but that's a bug and then you just go pester me about it. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you have um, um, a slow connection or temporary loose connection, um, you might get a temporarily desynchronized application. Is there a way to be resynchronize it or have you something in types where you can make it guarantee that eventually the client will be synchronized with the server again? No, so actually this uh, relies on, uh, it's all built on top of WebSocket. So if you lose the connection, again, you get the nasty exception thrown and you can choose how to react to that. So uh, you don't automatically resync, unfortunately. So yeah, error, error recovery is definitely one area where we need to do some more, some more work. But then do you think you can make it type safe that the, uh, you can guarantee that not only it's possible to communicate between the client and the server, but that all the communication will eventually be resynchronizable or at least come to some fixed state. Well, essentially you're going to uh, you're not going to proceed beyond the uh, the uh, beyond where you lost your connection, right? No, but uh, I mean the client can try to reconnect to the server after a while, and can it then completely uh, um, oh, yeah, continue catch up from where it left off? Sorry. So you mean continue where it left off? Yeah, something like that. For, uh, uh, well, yeah. No, not yet, unfortunately. That's okay. definitely some that would be a really cool feature if you had that. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, and many people are interested in this, since some people have blamed me for not having ported this to some other compiler that's not installable to compile install yet. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, an announcement. Uh, another question. So, if anyone could come. Let's thank the speaker first. So once you're done web programming, you'll be very thirsty, and we have an industrial reception at the Museum of World Culture at 6.30 today. Uh, it's probably 200 meters away from here, uh, and it's not the dinosaur museum, it's the other museum, the local museum. So you find yourself surrounded by dinosaurs, uh, 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 go find the other museum. And <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it would be good to show them for because all of the ICAP and CFP sponsors will be there, so, uh, along with a private tour of the museum as well. So uh, hopefully, hopefully you see that. Thank you. You could walk towards the dinosaur, and then the that's right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Where are the dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> so our last talk today is towards making web applications dash x safe. Hi everybody. Uh, so my name is Abid Levy, uh, and uh, like you said, I'll be talking about making web applications dash x safe. I added the towards at the last minute to the title because there's still some caveats, unfortunately. And